Good evening and welcome to Chasing the Facts. We're back after a short hiatus uh, this past summer. Uh, Chelmsford Telemedia completely revamped its uh, studios and workrooms and so forth. I've just had the tour from the staff. I'm very impressed and I'm told that some of the changes that were made are actually going to help with the broadcast by enhancing picture quality and other things. So let's this is our test run, our first uh, time back on, in the new studio, so uh, hopefully uh, what they tell me is true. We'll uh, wait to see uh, after the show. So this evening, our guest to start off the new season is Todd Melanson. I'm going to ask you, because I've heard different pronunciations of that name. Is that correct, Melanson? What is it? Melanson. Melanson. And the running joke here in the studio is Chase can't get a name right, okay, so, and I don't. So Melanson, so I'm going to take my little pen and I'm going to draw the, the uh, accent right on the A like they would in, if this were French. Melanson, okay, beautiful. And hopefully I won't make that mistake again. And you are the environmental compliance manager yes, sir. at the Chelmsford Water District. So we're glad to have you and uh, we're always glad to get updates as to what's going on with the water. And just before we get into the discussion, and I'll ask you to, to follow up on it, uh, just to remind our audience, the uh, administration of water in Chelmsford is not under the direction and control of the town government. Our, our water department is a separate unit. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to let Todd give you the technical explanation for what that means. So go ahead. So public water systems are uh, come under the um, come under the heading of um, a bunch of different ones that determine what you are. We're a community one um, based on our size and we're a small to medium size. Um, there are different ways they exist. They can exist as a water department where their water receipts or what people pay for their water go into the general fund and then through a budgeting process um, get their budget or they are part of the town but they have what is called an enterprise account, a water enterprise account where the money that you pay for your water goes into that and it can only be used for water operations. And then you have what are called special um, um, districts and that's what we are. We are a water district. Um, it means we are separate. We are a municipal entity. Um, we have our own elected officials. We abide by open meeting law and everything like that. But our sole concern is water. Everything we take in goes from water. Um, you're, you know, the tax base does not go and pay for any of the water-related activities that you're doing. Um, and then the fourth way is you can have what are called contract operators. You hire a company mm -hmm. to run your water department. Um, in Chelmsford, there's three. Um, if three separate districts. Three separate districts. We're the largest. We're probably, in round numbers, probably about about 80 percent, probably mm -hmm. uh, 78 to 80 percent. North Chelmsford is anywhere from 15 to 18, and then east is is what's left. It's the smallest dis district. Um, and when, when I first came to town, it was 1979, and I recall we had a fourth district. There were actually five at one time. There were five, that. okay. So you had two what are called consecutive systems. They got their water from us. Everyone calls us center. Um, they didn't, they didn't, so they didn't have any sources of their own, but they, they um, collected the money and stuff like that. Okay. It was basically... An administrative... And, yeah, district, right? and so they actually, I think West in the 50s or so rolled into our district mm -hmm. and then in I think it was the early 80s South Chelmsford that, South that's what I remember South right. South became part of okay. um, what what everyone calls center district and North has stayed what it is so if you were to take a map pretty much anything in, in the northern part of the town above Route 3 or right around Route 3 mm -hmm. North is the North Chelmsford okay. Water District. The little nub between Bulrica, Lowell, and Tewksbury that juts out a little bit, mm -hmm. that's east and we're everything else. Okay, so east would be the smallest in terms of the number of uh, water Finish. takers? Yes. And, I, and also infrastructure? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, I've, I'm often asked this by folks. Um, are the districts interconnected? So can north get center water? Can center get north water? And somebody even 
mentioned to me that we are able to get water from Lowell. So, so you are required to have mm -hmm. um, what they call um, emergency connections. Mm -hmm. The problem, so we were actually feeding part of North when they were doing the work on Route 40. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a, an emergency connection with a meter and we fed the, um, the, that section of North for a while. Um, we are interconnected with East um, on somewhat of a, not directly. Um, the pressure on 129 for firefighting is, is ours. They don't have enough pressure to, to meet the requirements of some of the larger buildings. Um, so we give the fire protection, but they give the domestic. East does have um, a direct connection to Lowell that they pull from regularly. Um, um, there's two meter pits right on the interconnection there. We have an emergency connection with Lowell, but the problem with everybody around us is that our pressures are higher than anyone else. So to get water from an uh, a entity that has a lower pressure, we have to boost it in the process. So we do have a mobile pumper vehicle or mm -hmm. trailer that can boost that pressure. In fact, it was used, I believe, like in the early 90s when there was a massive drought. Um, and they, they did pull water from Lowell mm. to back in the day. And that source for Lowell is the Concord Mer River? Merrimack. Oh, Merrimack River. Merrimack River. Wow. Um, thinking back 40 or 50 years, I would not probably wanted to drink out of the Merrimack River back then, so hopefully that situation has <laughs> improved. Well, they do have treatment, <laughs> and they do yeah. have to meet the same sort of requirements right. and stuff. So, I mean... I understand people's hesitancy, but the surface water treatment plants are fairly sophisticated. Um, it requires, so for an operator, you have to have a license, mm. and they're broken up into four tiers. You have distribution and treatment, and um, the surface water plants require 4T, which takes a lot of um, educating, testing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, continuing education credits. So. It's, it's, it's a fascinating and I think somewhat complicated area to understand mm -hmm. as we were talking before we got on the show. You know, if you've never done the job, you probably don't know everything that's involved. So it's, a, it's one of those things. So we have the water district. We have three. We had five at one point. Then it got down to four and three. And, and my understanding is the, the, the way that developed, they were initially fire districts. Water originally was always fire. It was never drinking. Mm -hmm. um, if you go down the Cape, some of them are still called fire districts. Really? And what they did is they put lines in the ground, and if you paid the fire department that had put that line in the ground, they would fight your fire. If they didn't, they wouldn't. <laughs> the Industrial Revolution happened, um, and you had that massive shift from agrarian society mm -hmm. to more industrial. You had people living in concentrated areas. You needed to be able to supply them with water. And that's where it made a switch from just fire to fire and mm -hmm. drinking. Um, and that's kind of what, what is there today. So probably most municipalities in Massachusetts uh, started off with the fire district. And then over the period of time, it evolved into a, a municipal service, just to, like you say, drinking and use water and so forth. And at that point, they decided to come under the control and authority of the municipality, but there are, we have a situation in Chelmsford where that isn't true, and there are other towns that are like us that have the independent I think there, I think there's a, like 135 districts. I think there's 78 communities that have multiple water entities mm -hmm. in them. Um, so we're not, we're, we're probably in a minority, mm -hmm. but we are, not like uh, it's not bias. an outlier. No, it's yeah, not. No, not that's the point, right? And it's actually the kind of the model of way they would like to see water. They would like to see water removed from um, local politics um, things that come up occasionally and stuff. Where their sole focus is water, and that's all they have to worry about. And and I think there's a very powerful argument to be made for that. And and the way we're structured in Chelmsford, uh, as you know, under our charter, we also have other independent operating uh, authorities uh, or units that, in some cities and towns, they're under direct town control. And I example is the cemetery commission. Mm -hmm. Okay, we elect our cemetery commissioners. 
and the town does not have direct control over those operations. And as Todd said earlier, the benefit of that, and I'm not, this is nothing against the town, the current administration I trust implicitly with financial management, I think they've demonstrated their competency over the years, but you don't know 15 or 20 years from now who's going to be running your town. Mm -hmm. And if you have these independent authorities, a good argument in favor of that is that the town can't get its hands on the, on the revenue that comes in. So in, in towns, uh, using the cemetery example, because I, I know of some towns where this is the case, the cemeteries are not as well maintained as they are here in Chelmsford because the town is able to divert some of that cemetery earmark money off into other things can't do that when you have an independent elected commission. You can't do that with the water districts. No. Okay, so whatever they take in as revenue, folks, from the ratepayers, that, as Todd said earlier, that is 100% dedicated to the water supply operations. And just from my perspective, you, you tell me if I'm right or wrong, I look at some other municipalities around us, and I think our rates for the service we get are extremely good and favorable. So I would say we're, for a community our size, um, for a system our size, we're probably in the median, rate right in the median. Mm -hmm. We might be a little bit on the higher side of, of the overall median, but we you're still paying less than a cent, um, any, a gallon. It's which, a great deal. Yes. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot to run the system. Um, we're going through a lot of regulatory change. Um, the environment seems to be shifting a little bit around us. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're, we've recorded at our weather station, we're, we're almost at 70, in, yeah, excuse me, 70 inches of precipitation for the year, and it's not even over yet. Uh, that's very interesting. You said a bunch of stuff there that I'd like to follow up on, and I'll start with the last. You talked about the wet uh, weather that we had this summer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know, I, I, I know you, I know all of your water commissioners, but uh, particularly uh, Rick Romano, who was just elected. And I was talking with him uh, a few weeks ago, and I, you know, I just asked him, "How's things going? You know, you're a new commissioner. How do you like?" He said, "You know," he says. Believe it or not, uh, and, and, and I preface that by saying, well, you must be happy because we have all this rain. Okay, so that's an ignorant statement from <laughs> me because I don't know how water districts run, right? Mm -hmm. But I make that statement, and I say, well, you must be happy, you know, because people complain constantly about the water bands, and you're happy with it. He says, well, he says, yeah, you would think that. He said, but you know what else? He says, our revenue's down. <laughs> well, why is your revenue down? Well, because people aren't watering their lawns. <laughs> and I said, you know, I haven't watered my lawn once so this I have past a summer. So that, I thought, was, you know, this, these are things that people don't think of. You so know? my perspective's a little bit different than yeah. the commissioners because they have to worry about the fiduciary responsibility. Of course. For me, it's compliance. I get very nervous about uh, when the water doesn't move, especially in the summertime, mm -hmm. um, water age is something stagnant that we have, stagnant water stagnant i would say water age I, okay I'm all right that's a, that. that's a but you term. can you can get creation of biofilms yep. um we chlorinate so if the water sits for long periods of time we can uh, create what are called disinfectant byproducts so for me and i'm the water conservation officer for the district so i'm the one who goes around and enforces the water restrictions now which, did that did your position following up on what you just said you're the environmental compliance manager so that makes perfect sense but but did your position exist like 30 years ago was that a thing okay i didn't think so and that's that so makes there's more of us now yeah. there are a lot of people the regulations are changing so quickly mm -hmm. and so dramatically it, it requires a lot um but so before i came here i think there was one in westford littleton and acton I'm the first one to hold the position that they created. In I, Chelmsford. In Chelmsford. No. <clears throat> um, now, I think there's somewhere statewide, somewhere on the order of about 25 of us that are, quote-unquote, compliance people. 
or environmental compliance. Now, I assume you have to undergo specialized training and, and things of that nature, or is that just part of your so background? I, so, yeah, uh, more so part of the background. Okay. There's no title, there's no, tr there's no licensing for it. Okay. Um, but I am, you know, I am a licensed operator. I have, um, I have a three in distribution, uh, uh, what they call a two, uh, level two in treatment in full, and then I have what is called if you don't ha if the system you're in isn't a f um, so like we're a two system right now. I have a three, what's called operator in training, but because I'm one below it, I have to do two years of having the two T in full before I can apply for the. Now, three what do the numbers signify in that? It's just the complexity of the system. Okay, so a three would be the. It, the four is the top, the three is the next level down. We're a two. And we're a two. Well, actually, that's not bad. No. And no. we might, with the, you know, we'll no. get to PFAPs in a moment. Yes, but, we will. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, you know, with everything we, we potentially will add for PFAS, it might make us a three. I'm not sure. There's a certain number of things you have mm -hmm. to count in and mm -hmm. what it changes and stuff like that. Well, I, I have to tell you, again, not knowing really much at all about water, but the last... Uh, 15 years of my professional career, I, I was a uh, compliance person. I was the director of, of various types of compliance mm -hmm. for my company. And the regulations in, in any of these areas, any area, it, they are just overwhelming and burdensome. You're dealing with federal and state, and they all don't necessarily jibe, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Uh, and the position, in, in my opinion, when you're having, running a, an operation such as the water district, and we're talking about water that is ingested by humans, mm -hmm. so this is about as important as it gets, you better be on top of, 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 of what you are supposed to be doing compliance-wise in terms of you know, the quality of the water that's, that's, uh, that's uh, going in. So I'm, so I'm, that, I'm surprised we don't have more. I mean, <laughs> you, we have one person now, what about the other districts? Do they have their own? I, I think North is trying to. I think they yeah. may have created a part-time position. Yeah. I don't think East does. And kind of give you a back, back, my background is I have a degree in uh, chemistry and biology. Well, that sounds perfect to me. I, for 12 years, was um, a senior uh, intelligence sergeant for a cavalry squadron in the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. um, and I was an analytical chemist and a microbiologist in water labs for about 18 years. Okay. So one, I can read regs, because if I can read army regs, I pretty much Absolutely. read any of them. Absolutely right. Um, but I have the background in dealing with water quality issues, um, mm -hmm. being able to talk to residents about them, um, and, and the investigative part kind of works with my mind, and just understanding the regulations for, for mm -hmm. the, you know, we deal with, it's not just what we test for in the water, you have compliance issues with the amount of water we pull out of the ground, we are restricted with how much we can with registered volume, permitted volumes, permitted mm. sources. So there is a whole host of things we have to stay in compliance with. Yes, uh, and, and, and that's, that's, that's what we want. And again, people turn on the tap and the water comes out and everybody is happy. Mm -hmm. But what, what supports that? I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. The rates. And the rates do. I've been in Chelmsford since 1979. Uh, been at my present address since 1984, and of course we have uh, Chelmsford Center Water District takers. And uh, so that's what, 44 years, right? And I can't think of a single instance uh, where we had an issue or a problem with the quality of water or even the supply. I think in all that time we may have had two service interruptions where, you know, it was a, a break in one of the mains, okay? And uh, the last one we had was not too long ago, within the last year, it was on uh, Brook Street. And you guys came down and it was fixed within three or four hours. I mean, it took longer to put the street back together, but, <laughs> but, but, we, had, but we had the water so, flowing, you know? So uh, our guys are really, really good. It's I, unbelievable, I, the service that you From get. the time we yeah. find a break, our distribution crew, our treatment guys, they're yeah. really some of the most dedicated people I've come across. Mm -hmm. The breaks are usually four to six hours. We've had a few outliers that are mm -hmm. bad ones. 
Um, but most of the time, most people don't lose their water because we can gate around it. You look back to the ice storm, um, people never lost their water. They never lost water pressure. Mm -hmm. um, if you look back to this past weekend where we had the, the wind, nobody lost power. Uh, nobody lost water. Everybody water. lost power. But you always had the ability to flush your toilet or turn your water on. So right. that's something they take a lot of pride in. Which is why I thank God I'm connected to municipal water. Because <laughs> if you're on a well, you are dependent on electricity, and mm -hmm. that's a problem. You know? Yes, sir. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great service. Uh, I've only been on a well once in my life. Uh, and I, in that particular situation, I was on a well and I was on a septic. Mm -hmm. And I had problems with both. This is back when we were first married, and I said to my wife, I said, from now on, <laughs> we don't live anywhere that doesn't have municipal sewerage <laughs> and doesn't have municipal water, and then I threw the gas in, too. I said, I want, I want a gas line to my house. Those three things I have to have. And anybody who's had trouble with wells appreciates the, the, the service that you get uh, from you folks because you just don't, you don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, one question I get asked often, occasionally you turn on your tap and the water comes out and it's brown. And it doesn't usually last that long. So what causes that? So there's a couple things. Um, we treat currently primarily for iron and manganese. Mm -hmm. That's what our filters are set up for, our plants are set up for. But those only came online in the early 2000s. So we have somewhere 80 to 100 years of iron and manganese built up in the side of the pipes. It's called tuberculation. Um, when you have a reversal in flow uh, or a change in direction, a change in pressure in the system, it can cause a discoloration event. If you have a main break, mm -hmm. something of that nature. Um, we had uh, a release valve uh, get stuck at the plant and it pushed out for a very short period of time, but it caused a major disruption. Um, that is what primarily causes um, the discoloration. If you're at the end of a dead end road, where the pipe stops and ends, the closer you get to that dead end, the more likely you are to, to experience it or for it to get away. It, causes, it takes us to flush it out. One of the things I find the biggest problem in, in people's homes is hot water tanks. Those should be flushed out annually, if not biannually. Mm -hmm. There's a little spigot on the bottom, you put a hose and you yep. flush out. Nine times out of 10 when I go to do an, um, a field investigation because someone has a... Uh, a discolored water problem, and I can't, I can't get to find out why on the phone. I'll go and do a visit. Um, one, I find the interaction with the residents helps calm them, um, and usually I'm able to identify what the problem is. And almost all the time, it's these hot water tanks. They that sediment gets stuck at the bottom. Everyone has the all-in-one mixer valve, so it doesn't really separate the two. So when they turn it on um, or they flush a toilet, it's it, it, it can look discolored. Um, we did have an occasion last year and again this year, and it's related to the heavy precipitation, where it pushed through naturally occurring organic material. They're called tannin and ligands. Um, they give the water a tea appearance. Mm -hmm. um, we're not set up to remove those currently. Um, they're, they're not health related. It's, it's primarily aesthetics only. Um, we found the one main well that was contributing to that issue, shut it down. It took about a week or so for it to clear out of the system, depending where you were in it. Um, but that's the two primary reasons why you end up with this colored water. Okay, that's, that's good to know, folks. So make, make a note of that. And it's in, the hot water thing is interesting because I put a, a new tank in about a year ago, and I asked the uh, plumber, I said, uh, should I you know, do the flush thing? <clears throat> and he said... Yes, all the reasons you just gave. He said, but you know what? He said, if you forget to do it and five years goes by, he said, don't touch it. He said, he said you want to start and on an annual cycle and do it once a year or even every six months. That's what I was told. So that essentially confirms what, what you were saying. It makes it, it, makes it more efficient because yep. that sediment layer becomes a heat sink. So the wa exactly. it's always trying to heat the water. Um, and it directs that heat at the bottom of the tank. So if a tank fails... Yep. Um, you have, you have a problem. Okay, so we have five minutes to talk about PFAS. All right, let's so go. All right, um, we are under orders to do treatment for PFAS mm -hmm. for the Crooked Spring treatment plant. We started down that process. We did a pilot study. 
And then we stopped and thought, and we started looking at the price tag, and there's PFAS in all of our water. And it's not just a Chelmsford issue. Roughly 20 per, 20 to 25% of all community systems, so there's roughly 1,700 mm -hmm. public water systems, 300 to 380 or so are what are called community systems, systems mm -hmm. like us. Roughly 20 to 25% of them have either already built or in the process of building or in process of getting funding for PFAS treatment. So PFAS is nasty stuff. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, we have it. We violated once at Crooked Spring. Um, we, as of August, submitted for the SRF funding uh, for PFAS treatment, which mm -hmm. currently stands at 0% interest with a certain amount of principal forgiveness. Um, the numbers are fairly high. You're limited to 15 a year, so if you go over 15, what they do is they break it up into each additional mm -hmm. year you get 15 more or whatever out until you, you reach your total amount if you get approved. The process, it's a competitive process. We will find out somewhere between January or March of next year if we've made the intended mm -hmm. use plan. Um, once that happens at our annual meeting, we will ask to the voters to approve the ability to borrow. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, if, we, you know, if that gets approved, then the bids go out uh, the next fiscal year and we start. So if everything goes to plan, um, they should start late 2024 mm -hmm. or early 2025, actual with the construction, with the hope of being operational by 2026. Mm -hmm. But we're doing all three plants. We're not just doing Crooked Spring. That's, that's good to hear. And so you're constantly monitoring uh, the PFAS levels. And when you do get uh, a spike or something that causes it to go over the allowable parts per million, you do notify the water takers. So the... the this regulation is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. one high detection does not cause a failure. Okay. So it's based on a quarterly average. Um, I will say that heavy precipitation, we've traced that back. Every time we've had heavy precipitation, our numbers have gone up. Mm -hmm. And they have gone up. So the September sample will determine whether we have a violation or not. Um, to tell you which way it's going to go, I don't you know. You don't know, right. It, and we're talking parts per trillion, so... Pa excuse me, parts per trillion. Yes. That's significant, yes. So one okay. part per trillion is one ink drop in 20 Olympic swimming pools. I'm limited to 20 in a quarterly average. Mm -hmm. So we may have or may not have another violation. So, so I don't it's know. a very, it's a high standard. Yes, it yes, is. Very high standard. Um, the other thing is EPA is talking about lowering it to four parts per trillion for two of wow. the compounds, wow. PFOA and PFOS. Um, primarily, we're looking at what is called granular activated carbon, um, and that will be a separate building added on to or off of the current buildings. Um, Crooked Spring and Riverneck will each have one of those. Mm -hmm. Smith Street, our seasonal plant, the plan is to treat the water for iron and manganese and then transmit through a pipe from Smith Street to Crooked mm -hmm. Spring and treat the PFAS there. That's good, and, that, and the, uh, the, car the carbon uh, material, I think, is what you find in your refrigerator filters. Is that true or not? Sort of, it's, it's a lot different. The carbon yeah. filters in your refrigerator and whatnot, I don't think remove PFAS. They don't this remove is, PFAS. This, is, this stuff is fairly specific. It's a well-known yeah. treatment for other things, mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we're gonna be using it for um, um, PFAS. And the plants will be set up in case we need additional mm -hmm. treatment. Well, that is all good to know, and we're glad that you're on top of things. We have about 30 seconds left. Is there any quick thing that you want to tell the audience? I would ask for their support when we come up um, for annual meeting. Um, I don't think the 0% interest in principal forgiveness will be around forever. It's part of the Federal Bill Act, the uh, Federal Infrastructure Act. Um, it has five years of life in it. Um, it's the only way we know of to remove this stuff. And with that being the case, if anyone has a question, feel free to give me a call at the district, 978-256-2931. My name is Tom Collins. Yep, folks, uh, we got to do it. Todd, thank you very much for being our guest, and I find this uh, fascinating, because I don't know much about it, you know, I am 